today is traditionally referred to as Palm Sunday, or some may call it Passion Sunday. It commemorates the historical and significant events of a man named Jesus and his triumphal entry into the city of peace, which is Jerusalem, days before his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Jesus, who is the full revelation of God in human form, fully man and yet fully God. God was before time and space even existed, before you and I and the entire universe was made. God was. And then he revealed himself through history and, and through holy men and women of old. But, but humankind is stubborn, as you might know, and you might have experienced and refused to listen to the prophets and the preachers and the kings and priests that God sent to speak to human beings like you and I. So finally, God said, humanity, I am coming to you in human form so that I can show you who God truly is what he looks like and how he talks and how he walks his life out and then how you can in turn truly live yourself as well. This is what Jesus does for us. Jesus came and he lived this perfect life that no human had lived before. Lived without sin, lived without shame and broken habits, lived fully for God and in obedience to God in human form. But humanity rejected Jesus as if to say, you are good, too good to be true. So they tried him according to human law, and they found him guilty of perfection. Something that we are totally unable to achieve without him as much as we try hard to achieve it. Jesus died this brutal death at the hand of man, but the story doesn't end there. Like the ancient prophecies and prophets foretold in his death that he would actually conquer death and hell. Not only for himself, this is the beautiful good news, but in his resurrection to new life, he actually made it possible for you and I to see that he truly is God so that we could do what? So that we could put our trust in following his way of living obeying his words of truth and being filled with his Holy Spirit, which gives us new life abundant. All this to say that I want to talk to you tonight about Jesus, who is an unconventional king who came to introduce an unconventional kingdom with unconventional methods for an unconventional purpose. Now, to be unconventional is to, to act or dress or speak or otherwise exist outside the, the bounds of cultural norms. You might say, well, what does that even mean? So, like, if you eat cheeseburgers for breakfast, and I know there's a couple of you in the room who do, you just might be unconventional, right? Jesus taught and he lived out unconventional. He lived and preached about a way of living that often is in stark contrast to our ideologies and our philosophy of life, our framework and perspectives of living life out loud. But he invites into this way of living that is upside down. He lives in an upside, he introduces us to an upside down kingdom, an unconventional way. Story after story in the gospels, which means good news. Jesus would start his teaching with, the kingdom of heaven is like... Like a grain of mustard seed, like a merchant in search of pearls, like a net that is thrown into the sea, the kingdom of heaven is like, like a treasure hidden in a field. Like 30 plus times alone, the kingdom of heaven is mentioned in Matthew's gospel. But I want to look at three stories with you today, three specific ones. The first one is this. There is a story of Jesus, of a time that he is giving one of those hashtag blessed sermons, Right? Hashtag blessed sermons, which might some, what some might call the declaration of the kingdom or the manifesto of the kingdom of God. Not, not one of those, you know, tell of evangelists, lay your hand on the TV, send me 30 bucks, and you're going to get double portion in three weeks. Not one of those kind of sermons, right? Better than that, in Matthew 5 and verse 1, 1 to 12, and I'll have it for you on the screen. Thanks back there, Jeremy, for helping us. Jesus, this is Matthew 5, 1 to 12, if you have your Bibles. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed. Now, the poor in spirit isn't a self-hatred kind of concept or a belittled posture or a confession of insignificance. Instead, it's a confession that I can't do this alone. That I was separated from God in rebellion to his way and his, and his will and in dead works of selfishness and without moral virtues and inadequate in my own ability 
to reconcile with God. I could not make this happen on my own. I'm spiritually broke. I don't have the money to pay for it. I can't prove myself to God. So that's what blessed are the poor in spirit. He continues, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So he's like, I don't know. Like blessed, doesn't that mean I got some new J's to wear tonight? Like that sounds blessed to me. Like, can I at least pay my mortgage payment? Can I get some, a new car? Like, come on, blessed sounds a little bit different than this, right? Blessed are the pure and in, in, are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account? You're like, what? That does not sound very blessed, right? We're talking about an upside down kingdom, an unconventional way, an unconventional king. Then he says this in verse 12, rejoice and be glad. You're like, For what? For being persecuted and hated? I ain't think so, right? Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you as well. Hey, you're not alone in this. People have been persecuted centuries before you for their, his, their belief in God and Yahweh. Completely counterintuitive when we read this, this blessed, this hashtag blessed sermon on the mount or sermon on the plain. Jesus' itinerant ministry. He preached this message many times actually. Completely counterintuitive for our way of behaving and thinking. It's so radically and astonishing and countercultural to our way of living and this is an unconventional king and kingdom. Let's look at story number two. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem from Galilee, which is the, the northern part of Israel. And Jesus is ministering. He, he chose the 12 apostles. He's preaching and, and performing miracles and feeding people. And in chapter nine of Luke's gospel, he sets out towards Jerusalem, continues to teach about this unconventional kingdom through parable and story and sending out his followers to declare the kingdom of heaven. And picking up the story in Luke 18 and 31 to 34 and taking the 12. He said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and, and everything that is written about the son of man by the prophets will be accomplished. Verse 32, for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And, and after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. But they understood none of these things. So he takes the 12 apostles aside who have most likely given up much of what they had done and did, their lifestyles, to follow Jesus as a rabbi and teacher. Jesus gives them a little bit of the inside scoop. And here's what I'm about to, to go through and about to give up. I will be delivered to the Gentile person, the pagan people who want to kill me. To be shamefully treated, flogged, and killed. Like Jesus knew full well what he was getting himself into by traveling to Jerusalem. He didn't have to go, but he did with full knowledge of both his fate and the victory that was to come. By no means was, was Jesus, though a blind victim of his circumstances, but his followers, they just didn't seem to understand. Their expectation of Jesus was so different, right? Being the Messiah and all, you're like the rescuer who was, supposed, you know, not to be the Messiah of suffering or about suffering. You're supposed to be the rescue who, rescuer who would conquer the Roman occupiers who have held us under their occupation for years and have been abusive and they're telling us what to do. And we want you to come, Jesus, and, and sit on the throne and wipe out all these people. To set up a physical kingdom of rule and reign, from Jesus' description of what was to come didn't make any sense. And friends, still today, often the message of Jesus doesn't make sense in our conventional world because Jesus is bringing an unconventional message. It's an unconventional kingdom to a world that just doesn't understand. So what? He goes on, he's healing more people, telling more stories, taking the long way. He tours through Jericho. Maybe you might remember that name from Sunday school if you grew up in Sunday school. Now, hey, 
He's passing through to Jerusalem, and there was, this, there was this rich man who was a tax collector, and nobody likes tax collectors even still today, although it's digital now, living in Jericho, which was also the home of the Levitical priesthood. And now tax collectors, they didn't get rich by, by following the rules or by being honest, but tax collectors at this, point, at this time made profit on whatever extra that they could get away charging, with chain, charging their clients. So it's kind of skimming off the top. No, it's going to be a little extra, and they would take that home and bless themselves. So they were naturally, you know, fairly motivated to make taxes as high as possible. They were quite certainly despised by the Jews at this time period. John the Baptist, when, when he was asked by tax collectors how they could get right with God, you know what he says to them in Luke 3.13, I don't have that for you, but he told them to collect no more than what was appointed to collect. So if you were a rich tax collector, you were quite possibly rogue and dishonest and you were probably bullying people and giving them knuckle sandwiches and like, now, nah, bro, you're going to give me some more money here, right? I'm going to take your kids if you don't. You're like, go ahead. This tax collector's name was Zacchaeus, meaning pure one, which he wasn't quite living up to his name, actually, at that point. Well, at least until he met Jesus, right? Luke adds to his description of this man as being short in stature. And he heard that Jesus was coming into town. And maybe because he was short, what does he do? You might know this story. He climbs up into a tree. He could dare to get a chance to see this Jesus that he's heard about, that everyone's raving about. He's healed people. He's he's fed 5,000 with a couple barley loaves and some fish, some fish sticks. And like, what's going on here? What's this Jesus all about? Can you imagine this wealthy man in his nice, you know, Armani or Gucci matching velvet tracksuit, whatever that looks like back then, yet so spiritually curious that he climbs up into a tree with a zeal and with a willingness to to see Jesus. God, I want to see him. He did what may have actually been beneath him, beneath the dignity even of a growing man, let alone a wealthy man, right? So Luke 19 and and 1 to 7, picking up the story, Jesus, he entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. The chief tax collector was rich and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on the account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, what did Jesus do? He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come on down for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried on down and came down and received Jesus joyfully. And when they saw him, they, the religious people around, or the ones who were like Jesus supporters, maybe when they saw it, they all grumbled, right? Like, what is he doing? Isn't he supposed to come over to my house? I'm like the holy one here. He's going over to Aunt Edie's house instead, right? Like, come on. Call me the guest of a man who is a sinner. Jesus called him by name and extended friendship to him. The, this man who was despised by his community, rejected by the religious people and, and his fellow Jew, Jewish neighbors and an outcast from his own, Jesus being the unconventional king that he is, that wasn't his way to do, to live. Jesus is a friend of sinners that we learn in scripture and was scorned for Jesus was often looked at as scandalous in this time period. Let's see how, I'm going to call him Zach now. Let's see how Zach responds to this unconventional king in Luke 19, 8 to 10. Zacchaeus, Zach, stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said, I'm going to give him four times as much, right? Crazy. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man, here's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Zach, don't worry about what these others have to say about you. I've actually not come to seek and save the righteous, but those who are far from me, those who do not know me, those who don't have a relationship with me. Because I'm an unconventional king with unconventional purposes and methods and mission. And what did Zach do? Zach, you see, he received this free gift of grace from Jesus. 
And at this time, friends, the law, the, the, the Mosaic law at this time that was in place required someone who had stolen to restore the amount they stole plus 20%. So if you stole 10 bucks, it would be 10 bucks plus $2. Am I, am I good math? I think so. Well, our new friend, Zach, what's he say? He's like, he cheerfully says, Lord, I'm willing to go above and beyond and give back what I've taken, half of what I have. And Jesus said, even before this story in Luke 18, which I don't have for you as well on the screen, but that it was impossible for a rich man to enter the heaven, to enter heaven. But, but, with, but with God, Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. He's an unconventional king and unconventional way and method and purposes. I see our friend Zach had what you might call religious people or in the Bible, you might even see it referred to as a repentance encounter. It was a life-changing decision to rethink what he thought he knew, to put away his How to Be Successful in Three Steps magazines, right? Unsubscribe from his favorite wealth YouTube channels. It was an unlearning moment for the sake of relearning the unconventional methods of the kingdom of heaven. And in this shift, this turn, this flip-flop, this flop right over, whatever you want to call it, turned around in Zach's heart. Zach responds with a newfound joy and with radical generosity. Like this is literally showing what is impossible with man is actually possible with God. Jesus, the unconventional Messiah, the unconventional king on his pilgrimage to restore the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. Made room to demonstrate to us what the kingdom of God on earth not only represented, but what it looked like in action. Jesus, who was this first seeker aware leader of other people, he came precisely to seek and to reach and to save lost and confused people. Scattered people like Zacchaeus, troubled people like Zacchaeus, like you and me, like me. Reordering our loves, transforming our lived out expressions and experiences. Third and last story for you today. Let's look at one more example of how the unconventional king continues into Jerusalem, which was not too far from Jericho, by the way, where he had just had lunch with Zacchaeus and saw Zacchaeus give his life back to Jesus, to following God, Yahweh at that time. So as Jesus, this unconventional king, fun fact, some 400 years before Jesus came, one of the ancients, Zechariah, found in the Old Testament portion of the scripture, foretold of these events that we're going to have, that we're going to talk about, we're actually celebrating today, that marks what Christians refer to as Palm Sunday. Zechariah 9.9, I think, yeah, here we have it for you. He said it this way, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Crazy how much scripture in the Old Testament foretells about Jesus coming. This unconventional king, he's nearing the city of Jerusalem now. Remember his disciples, his students, his followers had this expectation of Jesus that he had come for and was going to retake control of Israel and, and, and to be the political savior of that time. Finally, the ancient Hebrew way would not only be preserved, but we would actually conquer the Roman pagan conquerors, the occupiers. The timing of this visit is impeccable. The Passover feast was coming soon, and according to the historian Josephus, there would have been more than 2 million pilgrims pouring into Jerusalem around this time. Like, tourism's hot, right? You got your food truck out. You're ready to go everywhere. So Jesus, he, he asks a couple disciples to go ahead of him in preparation. Hey, can you go get some couple things done? I know it's going to be busy there. And I don't like that food truck. And I said, yeah, anyone have, you know, whatever, right? Picking up the story and fulfilled prophecy, though, in Luke 19 and 30, Jesus is saying this. He says, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? What are you doing taking my donkey, right? You should all say this, the Lord has need of it. 
Well, so those who were sent away and found it just as, as Jesus had told them. And as they were untying the colt, what happened? The owner goes, why are you untaking my donkey, right? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Crazy. The time has come. Jesus, this unconventional king, was distinctly on mission to, to enter Jerusalem to fulfill ancient prophecy. To fulfill his unconventional mission, the task that was set before him. He rides into town on, on a burrowed colt of a donkey in complete contrast to a king or a general of this time period returning to the city from war and conquest who would have, have similarly ridden in through the city, through the city gates and on the back of a war horse armor on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me some. Come on, clap your hands. Fanfare. Woo, look at me go. Look at my spoils. Right? Yet it was important that Jesus didn't gallop into town on a war horse, didn't come as maybe others would have expected him to come. He's unconventional, right? And that would have sent a message to the current time period that Jesus was a man of war, but coming on the colt of an ass, if you want to use scriptural language, King James Version, was significant to Jesus coming in his unconventional way. Some of you are just like, what? On a beast of burden. A donkey was the mount of a man of peace. A merchant man, as Drew was saying earlier, a a priest, an an unconventional king. The triumphal entry of Jesus drastically deferred to the normative of the present society's triumphal entries. It's different than what the conquering Roman soldiers would have done. And he was no threat to the local rulers. Like, this is the king of the Jews? Who is this guy? Where did he get this donkey? And he's no real hero. What are you even worshiping this guy for? Jesus escorted by and celebrated by, by people who didn't have a lot of money, maybe, who were peasants in that time, or by pilgrims, and even by women and children. No armor, no treasure, no blue check mark on his Facebook profile, or I guess his Instagram profile. Like, who is this guy? He's like nobody. No threat, right? No after party at a palace. He comes as a humble servant, unconventional instead of a majestic conqueror. And yet he was soon to be a triumphant servant. It's upside down to what we think of heroes and conquerors. No one had even ridden on this colt of a donkey. So it's interesting. Yet it made no difference to Jesus that the colt was unbroken. Or since Jesus, the very son of God, who was before creation, and through him all things were created, came onto the scene as man, and yet every creature was subject to him. And to make things even more interesting, Jesus had a price on his head. I don't know about you, but I'd be skulking into town if I had a price on my head. Right? Right? John eleven fifty seven 57 mentions that anyone who was to find Jesus was to report him so he could be arrested. Yet here he comes into town like, mm, mm. Hosanna, Hosanna. An unconventional king, unafraid. He was no stranger to borrowed things. He rode in a borrowed boat, came to town on a, Borrowed donkey, ate the Passover in a borrowed chamber, a borrowed dining hall, was buried in a borrowed tomb. An unconventional king with no amazing robes or chariots, no castles, no servant staff to do his bidding. See, no, he was all about the unconventional kingdom of God. And instead ruled by serving, by caring for the sinner and the brokenhearted, the abandoned, the sick and the maimed, Mark 10.45 tells us, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. Jesus, as as an unconventional king, didn't come to be served to set up a physical kingdom, to own everything, right? Control everything, have all the latest and finest gadgets, and didn't even have the political authority and power to a humankind craves and, and demands, and Jesus literally saw it fit to turn the world upside down by introducing humanity to an upside down kingdom. Back to this account of Luke 19 and 35. Finishing the story there, and they brought this colt right to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. 
And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road even as he was drawing, like it was red carpet here with people's coats, right? As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. That's why we worship Jesus with a loud voice. Did you know that? It's in scripture, by the way. For the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples, right? He's like, what? I tell you, if these were to shut up, the rocks would cry out in their place. It wasn't that Jesus was suffering from low self-esteem issues on, that, on this particular day and needed the affirmation, maybe. Like, come on, people, I'm Jesus. Can't you do better than that? No, Jesus' invitation to praise him is, is not for him as it is much for us. We value what we praise. And see, Jesus knows it because guess what? He was part of the creation star. He knows how we're wired, right? We value what we praise. We praise what we value. It's called worship. I just have to look at my bank account and my calendar often to see what I value most. Maybe my internet history even too. You don't have to look very far in our world and our in our own homes and in our expressions and experiences in our calendars and budgets to see what we value. God will get his praise and he invites and he's inviting you and I to be part of this kingdom, this unconventional kingdom, this unconventional method, this unconventional way of following him. See, here is our invitation today in consideration of Jesus as an unconventional king who came to introduce this kingdom and his methods and for his purposes. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve a mission that is bigger than myself. A rescue mission for the hearts and minds of all humanity, including you and I in this room too. Even the worst of the worst, you might think, man, I, I'm not that good of a person. I've done some really bad things, really stupid things. How could Jesus love me or want to be in a relationship with me? But you are the prize. You, the mission, the glory of the Father. It's always been about you and I and the billions before us and the billions to follow after. That all would be restored back into a healthy relationship with our God and our Father in creation. This is the will of our God, friends. See, Jesus didn't come up to, come to, to head up a rebellion, start a faction, but he comes as a humble servant with joy and celebrated in advance the very victory over death and hell that he was to accomplish so that you and I could have barrier-free access to God. There's no religious rites and practices that you have to do to get there, to be in relationship with him. It's a free gift of grace. It's a turning from my way of doing things to like, God, I want to follow Jesus. Can you teach me your way of doing things so that we can have freedom? Why? Because look at me and my broken habits. I don't have it all figured out. I still do things that hurt me and my loved ones and even God's heart himself. But I'm celebrating the fact that I can have freedom from my broken habits that brings feelings of death and despair in my life. Those things that bring anxiety in me and depression, hopelessness. Jesus teaches us a new way of living. It's an unconventional kingdom from within us that would reshape my ethics and reshape my values and even my behaviors. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven can be within you. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is the kingdom of heaven. He reintroduces us to an unconventional kingdom that is living within us and exuding from us. If you believe that he is Lord, put your trust in him. Even my attitude is made new. I can now worship and praise him. I have an attitude of gratitude. I can live my life with thanksgiving and it shifts my entire way of living and thinking. Offering a lifestyle of thanksgiving with my worship. His message is simply, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one is too far from him to be reached by his love. 
No one is too good for me to provide for, Jesus is saying. Even if you've been, maybe you grew up in church and did a lot of religious things. He's also saying, hey, you're not too good for me to reach you either. He simply says to inherit eternal life with me, trust in me, follow me in my footsteps, would you? Let me be the forgiver and the leader of your life. Not just, don't stop just at forgiveness. We love raising hands and got them all in, but don't stop there. Would you turn your life and follow him as well? Would you be my leader, Holy Spirit? Would you be my teacher? Would you be my comforter? Would you be my guide? He says, I will be your strength. I will be your joy in your time of sorrow and sadness. I will be your rest in your time of angst and worry. I will be your strength and courage when you're weak and faithless. I will be your wisdom when you can't seem to get it all figured out and put it all things together. I will be your purpose and I will be your fulfillment. I will be your everything. I'll take care of you. I'll lead you. I'll guide you, comfort you. For some of you, you've been serving a kingdom maybe that is filled with turmoil and chaos and judgment and self-harm and insecurity and fear and greed. Maybe your desires have been dictated by a master that never really seems to satisfy and money and sex and drugs and prescription drugs and social media likes and popularity. A king and kingdom that makes you strive for and, and work for and to drive yourself to know and frustrated you might be tonight. Today, like Zacchaeus, you could experience an unlearning for the sake of relearning. Simple act of surrender. Say, God, I don't have it all figured out. I don't even know what I'm doing with my own life. God, but from what I'm hearing from this crazy guy up front, it sounds like you got a couple things figured out. Maybe if I could just put my trust in you just a little bit tonight. And let's see what happens. Jesus can be a teacher. For some of you, life is still all about you. And for many of us, it is, right? And even in this moment, you're realizing, I can't really seem to achieve the satisfaction that I desire on my own. I've been trying really hard. Like Jesus, maybe tonight is the night for you to jump on your ass of humility. (laughs) Getting off our high horse of pride and self-indulgence. Because you too can be a merchant of hope. You can join the ranks of the, of the peacemaker himself. You can be a king priest and serving an unconventional king and kingdom in your priestly worship duties in the kingdom of heaven here and now that's within us. For those of you in the room maybe who have never said yes to a surrendered life to Jesus, God wants to make peace with you tonight. Through Jesus, he doesn't come to control your life. He simply says, hey, 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 would you be willing to leave behind your old way of life and begin to follow me? I've got a new way for you that's different than what you've been trying to do on your own. And guess what? It won't be as exhausting as this has been. And I, because you know what? I'm going to give you rest. (laughs) Those anxious thoughts, you stay up late trying to figure it all out, the finances and the budgets and the relationship angst and the boss who's crazy, whatever it is. Hey, guess what? I will be your peace (laughs) in the middle of your chaos. And you will begin to experience a deep, settled contentment again in your marriage and, and in your heart and in your restless and anxious mind. Hey, friends, the way of Jesus may not make sense to our host culture or our societal norms. It's unconventional to eat cheeseburgers for breakfast. It is counterintuitive unconventional, may even appear foolish. The king, this kingdom that we're talking about is not of this world. The king of this unconventional king is the prince of peace who shows us the heart of God like I started out with. He shows us how to live. And you're not left on your own means to make it happen anymore. His spirit empowers you. I mean, he gives you power to live out this way of Jesus gives you courage and boldness that can only come from God. I can meditate in yoga all day long and I don't walk out with a new sense of boldness and courage like I do when I walk in the spirit of the living God. Stretch. Go ahead and stretch. Do your exercise. That's a good idea. But when you put your trust in Jesus for his leadership in your life, your life will radically change. There'll be a new sense of hope all around the room. 
if you would like to take a step toward trusting Jesus today, to trust in Jesus as your, your forgiver and your leader, if that's you, I want to just invite you, maybe let's just all around, can we turn on, so there we go. All around, I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes and I right, just, I want to give, give a little bit of privacy for those who are in the room and saying, I don't know, this guy Chris, like he's got a couple crazy things going on, but something's going on in here tonight. I'm not even sure what it is. It's kind of stirring in my heart or my mind. This Jesus guy, Bible, I know there's a lot of crazy stuff that's known as religiosity and church and crazy Auntie Edie. She's like, but I just want to let you know that Jesus, he is unconventional. Maybe you like eating cheeseburgers for breakfast and tonight's your night to say, you know what, God? It is an unconventional way that you pre- that you talk about, that you teach about. It's an upside down kingdom. Following you, putting my trust in you and not trying to figure it out myself. That seems pretty odd. Isn't it really about me working my way through life and climbing the social ladder, climbing the corporate ladder? Getting more money. Ah, this partner's not working out. I'll just move on to the next one. Looking for fulfillment and looking for love and all the wrong places. If this message just spoke to you tonight, and you're saying, God, I, I want to I want to just take a step towards you. You don't have to have all the Christian language figured out. You don't have to even know where to find the book of Acts in the Bible or whatever. Can I just a fresh start to say, Jesus, I want to begin to trust you. I want to begin this journey of saying, can you teach me how to live? Can you come like Chris is talking about and empower me to live like Jesus? Like Jesus lived pretty radically you know, loving and kind. So if that's you tonight, if you want to take a step towards Jesus tonight, say, God, I want to try this. Would you be so bold as just to lift your hand? Because I want to pray for you. All eyes are closed around the room, heads are bowed, so no one's looking around to see who's doing what. But if that's you, if this has spoken to you tonight at all, would you just lift your hand boldly and say, that's me. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you, I see your hand as well. Thank you, I see you back there as well. God, thank you so much for stirring hearts. Jesus, this is me. I don't really know much about you, but tonight's a fresh start. I see your hand, thank you. Thank you, God, for stirring hearts around the room tonight. I need a fresh start, Jesus. God, I can't figure out this life, these relationships, these finances on my own. Got some of the stuff that's in me that's broken and I can't get rid of it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to some of these pleasures and things that are affecting and impacting me in a negative way. God, I want a fresh start. Anyone else? Thanks, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because this is what family does. Family prays for one another. Family cares for one another. So I want to pray with you. 